Home and welcome to Brit Am's Foundations of Messianic Judaism class. We are glad that you're here, and uh, if you've never been to our Foundations of Messianic Judaism class, it is an open forum discussion class where you can ask questions about uh, Messianic Judaism, about Judaism, about Christianity, about the connection between the two or the disconnection between the two, and I will try to answer those questions. Uh, I want you to understand that I don't make up answers, so if the Bible doesn't have an answer to a question, I'm going to tell you the Bible doesn't have an answer to that question, and uh, we'll go on from there. Uh, we're going to begin with prayer, and we have a long list of prayer requests, and I want, uh, if you don't mind, uh, not only listen to the prayer request, but when I finish giving the prayer request from our list, if you have one, if you'll put it in the comment bar, then we will... Um, have our people praying with you, and all those that are watching will have an opportunity to pray uh, with you about this, uh, these needs. So, okay, we have Fred and Robin, Amanda, Tracy, Jerry, Robert and Marquita, Jerry and Sandy, Tom and Jane, Donna, Victoria, Jerry, we want to pray for hospital workers and medical people of all kind, whether you're technicians or the people that are cleaning in the hospitals uh, and medical facilities and doctor's offices and clinics and all those folks that are on the front lines uh, dealing with the coronavirus as well as flu and, and all other things going on. We want to pray for grocery workers, truckers, all the people involved in getting food to us. We want to pray for those uh, who own restaurants and businesses that are affected by this. We want to pray for our first responders, for military, for our government, the U.S. government, for the government in Israel as they make decisions, uh, not only regular decisions about governing, but also decisions about how to deal with uh, the situation we're in. I also want to pray for our teachers. Our teachers are in an entirely different situation from where they've been previously because they're doing mostly online teaching as well as providing uh, courses and classwork to students and dealing with things in a, a totally different way. And, and uh, so we want to pray for our teachers. We want to pray for those that are disabled and those that are dealing with situations because uh, life is different right now and, and people that are, have handicaps or disabilities are dealing with things in an entirely different level. So we want to pray for them. So, uh, so please, uh, like I said, post your prayer requests uh, on uh, on the comment bar if you have any, uh, and people will pray for them. Please only use the first name of whoever we're going to be praying for, and also uh, you can post what their situation is, uh, but if it's like, you know, pray for so-and-so, they're committing adultery, don't put that in there. But if they're like, pray for so-and-so, they've got the flu, or pray for so-and-so, they need, uh, are looking for a better job or something like that, you can post that in the comment bar. But uh, so please do that as we pray. Avinu Malkeinu, our Father, our King, we thank you so much for this Shabbat. Uh, Father, Shabbat was made for man and it was a gift to us, a time where we can enter into sacred space of rest with you. We ask that your true shalom, shalom would be upon us. Father, we pray for all of these needs that we've been praying for, that there would be healing and provision and blessing. Uh, we pray for Aaron, who's looking for uh, for a job, and we pray for Donna, who uh, was taken to the hospital yesterday. Father, we pray for all those that run businesses, all the employees, all the people affected by uh, the government shutdown of, of certain segments of our society. And Father, we pray that uh, you would just drive this virus out from our land as uh, with just a strong wind, you would drive it out into the sea, and we would be delivered and set free from it. In Yeshua's name, we pray for our teachers. We pray for all those that have special needs, Father, that you would provide means to support and, and meet their needs. We pray for our homeless. We pray for those in prison and jail. Father, we pray for our single parents at this time when uh, they're having to do, uh, they already have to do the job of two parents, but now they're having to do the job of two parents and a teacher, uh, which is a, a huge difference in life. So we ask that your grace would be poured out that your blessings would be poured out, and Father, that you would uh, give people the abilities beyond their abilities to achieve the things that they need to for you. And we ask this in Yeshua's name. Amen. 
Uh, so I announced earlier, I said earlier that this was a open forum class that you can um, ask questions and I will try to answer those questions. So with that said, I want to say that the floor is open for questions right now. And if you have any, feel free to just type them in the comment bar and I will try to answer them to the best of my ability. Okay, we have, uh, there's no questions so far on the board, so I'm going to share uh, a few things as we go uh, through this. There's a lot of questions at this time about the timing of the death, burial, and resurrection. Okay, what is the one new man about? Thank you, Betty. Um, the one new man, there, there's a lot of discussion about one new man. There's been books written about it. There's been a lot of teaching about it. Unfortunately, much of the model of the one new man or the teaching of the one new man is actually opposite to what the Bible teaches. Uh, by the way, if you notice, I'm moving back and forth a little bit on the picture. The reason that's happening is because uh, Jonathan Baggett last week said that I wasn't centered on that TV and it was giving him the heebie-jeebies. So, uh, so I tried to center on that screen to make him feel comfortable. And Jonathan, if you're watching, it's all about you, man. So anyhow, the uh, one new man, basically what's taught about one new man today is that God is bringing Jew and Gentile into one body as one new man. And that is absolutely true. However, most cases it's taught backwards in other, it's teaching that the Jewish people will join Christianity uh, and all of its forms and functions where the Bible teaches that uh, Romans 11, that there's an olive tree, and because of unbelief, some of the natural branches of the olive tree were broken off, and then some wild branches or the Gentiles were grafted in to the olive tree of Israel. And then it talks about, so some of the branches, not all of the branches, we have to remember, it's not all of the Jews that fell into unbelief. There were hundreds of thousands of Jewish believers in the first century. But some of the Jews, some of those branches were broken off because of unbelief and wild branches were grafted into that olive tree. So the Gentiles become part of the olive tree, part of what Paul calls the commonwealth of Israel. And all of them together form this olive tree that's fed from the root that is Messiah, or the branch that is Messiah and the root that is the Torah. Uh, and when I say that, listen, I know that people get all concerned about, well, what do we have to follow about the Torah? What about this? What about that? Does everybody have to keep the Torah? Nobody can keep the Torah perfectly. All of the discussion that happens with that. But let me say this, that it is possible to keep the Torah in Messiah. Uh, and the Bible says the Torah is easy. It's not heavy. It's not burdensome. We have made it burdensome by our rebellion, by our decision not to follow the Torah, but the Torah is not difficult and not hard to follow. We, we have to bring our flesh under subjection to God's spirit. We have to choose to do that. Now, the question then becomes, what part of the Torah do I have to keep? Because people will say, well, everyone doesn't have to keep the whole Torah. Everybody, is, you know, and the truth is everybody doesn't have to keep the whole Torah. Everybody has to keep the Torah that's applicable to them. For instance, there were high priests, and the high priest was the only one Whoever the high priests were, were the only ones that had to keep the commandments concerning the high priests. And then there were the priests, and the priests had commandments that were only for the priests. And there were the Levites, and the Levites had to keep commandments that were only for the Levites. And then there were commandments for all of Israel, and there were commandments just for the king of Israel. And so there were commandments that were for soldiers, there were commandments that were for farmers, there were commandments that were for merchants, there were commandments... So each of these different there were commandments for fathers and commandments for mothers and commandments for uh, for parents together and, and commandments for children. And and so each of these commandments were uh, intentionally designed for different groups of people. So if you're not in the military, there's commandments for soldiers didn't apply to you. If you're not a priest, the commandments for priests don't apply to you. So it's a matter of finding out which of the commandments apply to uh, you to all Israel, and which of the commandments apply to you in particular to follow them. But 
the one new man isn't a model where Jewish people become Christians. And, and let me say that I'm saying that as, as a separate thing from Messianic Judaism that the disciples and the apostles were living uh, and espoused. So when I say that, it's not a knock on Christianity. Uh, it's saying that our goal is not to be uh, 20th century Christianity. Our goal is to be as close to what we can in following the example of Yeshua and the, and the disciples as we possibly can. Okay, let me look at the next question. The next question was, can you share my thoughts on the timeline of the Last Supper and Messiah's death, resurrection? Yes, I can. I was going to, uh, when there wasn't a question, that was where I was going. So let me say this. I, th I believe that Messiah's Last Supper happened and the evening of the 13th of Nisan, which as soon as the sun went down, it became the 14th of Nisan. So he had his Passover Seder at the during the 14th of Nisan is when what the commandment is given. You have to have it on the 14th. He did not have a lamb on his plate on their table because their lambs weren't slain until three o'clock uh, that evening. And, and the disciples would have participated in the lamb later uh, as part of what's going on. But this was an early of Nisan 14 Seder. If, if you look at the scripture, you don't see a mention of a lamb being served. You see matzah, you see the the bitter herbs, you see the wine, you see the, all that, but you don't, we don't hear matzah. Okay, so then he gets arrested after his Seder, and then it leads through the, uh, the trials and all the things that go on through the middle of the night, which is illegal and against the Torah, but that's a side issue. And then he dies on Wednesday afternoon at the same time that the lambs were being slaughtered at the temple. Somewhere between three and five o'clock, he is then uh, taken down and buried before sunset because the Thursday, as soon as it went from the 14th of Nisan to the 15th of Nisan, we enter the first day of unleavened bread. The first day of unleavened bread is a high Sabbath. And so they had to get him down off of the cross before the high Sabbath. The high Sabbath takes place. Uh, and then after the high Sabbath, we have uh, the time of him being in the ground. Three, he's in the ground three days, three nights. And I believe he resurrects right at the point of which Saturday ends and Sunday begins on our calendar at first fruits, uh, on first fruits. So. That's uh, my take on the death, burial, and resurrection and the timeline of how that happens. And uh, if you email me at raveric, that's R-A-V-E-R-I-C, at britom.org, I can send you a, a written paper that gives all the reasons. For instance, there has to be, uh, in between Thursday and Saturday, there has to be a time for shopping because the women go to buy spices. If we had a Friday crucifixion, uh, we don't have a time for the women to go shopping for spices. There's uh, when the the uh, coming entry into Jerusalem happens, all those things. So I have a paper that gives the timeline as I just presented it and all the scriptural proofs for why I believe uh, what I said. Okay, Christy. By the way, that was Stacy's question. Christy says. Can you explain the timeline of the events? And I just did that. So I hope I covered your questions. If I didn't, Christy, you can ask further. Um, does the Feast of Unleavened Bread, First Fruits, and Counting the Over Omer overlap in timing? Yes, they do. The fir First Fruits begins at sunset on the 14th, beginning to the 15th. Then the first, uh, I mean, Unleavened Bread starts on the end of the 14th at sunset through the 15th. Then we have unleavened bread beginning on the 15th of Nisan. And then we have first fruits on the 17th of Nisan. And they all overlap. And it's in a time period, time of, of eight days altogether that has become known as the season of Passover, although Passover is really just a few hours on the 14th. Uh, so, so that's my answer to that question. And that was from Lori. Uh, Morgan asked, what is my take on the 144,000 mentioned in Revelation? I believe that they are 12,000 from each of the 12 tribes, and I believe that they were just what the Scripture says. They would be uh, virgins, uh, and uh, 
So that's what I believe. Beyond that, the scripture doesn't give us any more information, and I won't make anything up. Okay, what is the miracle behind Hashem telling Moses to put a brass serpent on the pole in the wilderness to heal those bitten? Uh, why did he use a serpent to heal a serpent bite? Why was it brass? And why, and it's located in Bamidbar in Numbers. Okay, so first of all, it's interesting because uh, we uh, talk about this banner that's raised up, and it's called Nisi in Hebrew, but the word Nisi actually uh, me, it comes from the root word nes, and those that celebrate Hanukkah, those that celebrate uh, the Feast of Dedication, they may play a game called dreidel. And on uh, when we have on the dreidel, it has the Hebrew letters that spell Neskadol Hayasham or Neskadol Hayapo if you're in Israel. A great miracle happened there. The word nes means a miracle. And the serpent, what they did was they didn't look really look at the serpent. They looked at the miracle beyond the serpent. In other words, it's a perfect type and shadow of we have the evil one who in the garden caused death to come to God's people. But in order to get delivered from that illness, that sin, that sickness, that death, you have to look beyond the serpent to the miracle. And that miracle is Yeshua. And so that's why he said, well, if I be lifted uh, high and lifted up, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to me, referring to that, uh, that context. It's because it's not the serpent that they had to look at, but the serpent was in between them and the miracle. They had to look beyond the sin to the Savior. And that's exactly what we have to do today still we have to look beyond our sin, beyond the sin in the world, beyond the problems of the world, and look to our nace, the miracle that God provided, that lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. So, Leanne, I hope that answered your question. Uh, Shalom, Michaela, good to see you. Shalom, uh, Dingley. And Joe says, what do you say to someone who claims to be a believer in Messiah but doesn't walk as he walked? Um, I can tell you what the scripture says. Uh, the scripture says that uh, if you uh, claim to have faith without works, uh, show, me, show me your faith without works, I'll show you my faith by my works. Our fruit shows whether we're a true believer or not, or at least what level of believer we are. You know, M Matthews 5 says, uh, whoever uh, does and teaches others shall be least in, uh, uh, to violate the Torah uh, shall be least in the kingdom. Now, it does say they're in the kingdom, but it says they're least in the kingdom. So I'm not going to judge whether somebody is uh, redeemed or, or not, but I will say they're not walking as a redeemed person. There's not fruit in their life of that redemption, and those people I pray for uh, and try to teach and share with. Okay, uh, it's nice to see you, Anita and Barbara and Dana. Uh, Jan asks in Matthew uh, it says, again, a second time he went and prayed, saying, My father, if this cup can't pass away from me unless I drink it, your desire was the cup, the cup of wrath of God. I don't believe it was the cup of the wrath of God. Um, I believe it was the cup uh, uh, in the same way that um, we drink of his blood, but we don't drink of his blood. This was part of the redemption story, and Yeshua was basically not saying anything about the, the wine or the drink in the cup. He was saying, if there's another way, if there's any way to do this, let it pass away. But if not, I'm going to do what you desire. And I can tell you in my life that I've, I've said those same things. I have lots of circumstances, situations in my life where um, I, I the Lord asked me to do something that was difficult. It was painful. It was uh, and, and not because of something I did, but because of something someone else did. And so I do not believe Yeshua consumed or became the wrath of God. As a matter of fact, in Isaiah, it tells us he became the sin offering, the guilt offering, rather. It, he doesn't say he became guilty. And that's important for us to remember. Uh, on the cross, he said, Eli, Eli, lama azabtani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? But God did not forsake him. If you actually read Psalms 22, it's a depiction of what's going on at the crucifixion. 
and it was a teaching moment for Yeshua. He said, go read Psalms 22, because the end of Psalms 22 says, I did not desert you. I didn't leave you. I didn't do that. Uh, he became the um, both the sacrifice for sin and the one that carried the sin away from, from us. But he did not become sin. He became the offering for sin. Uh, Shalom Heidi, Shalom Paul, Shalom Pammy, Shalom Kaylee, Shalom Ruthie, Shalom Susan. Susan, happy birthday yesterday. Uh, Dana asked, during the time between Yeshua's death and resurrection, where did he go and why? And what day was he resurrected? I, I say I believe he was resurrected on Saturday. Uh, on the calendar, it would have been the 17th of Nisan. Okay. But on our calendar, on the uh, Greco-Roman calendar, the, the calendar that we use today for dates, uh, he was would have been resurrected sometime between Saturday at sunset and right after sunset. Uh, it says early in the day, and the day begins at sunset. So what did he do during the time between? I really don't know other than the scripture says he went down to Sheol, and he got the keys of death, hell, and the grave. And it, it says that he... Uh, uh, that he preached to the lost. Now, how all that happens, I'm not sure, and we're not given any details beyond that. Uh, but the other thing, and the most important thing that he did was uh, that he went to the heavenly tabernacle, and uh, he applied blood to the mercy seat to fulfill uh, the sacrificial need of atonement uh, for us. Okay, Shabbat Shalom, Kelly. Uh, from Morristown, Tennessee. Nice to see you on here. Can you describe some of the wrong things that happened to the Council of Nicaea? I can describe some of them absolutely. The Council of Nicaea uh, was established the Catholic doctrine of the Trinity. Now listen to me when I say this because I know somebody is going to get upset about this. But the original doctrine of the Trinity says three co-equal, co-eternal beings, which is polytheism. That doesn't mean that God isn't the Father, the Son, and the Ruach HaKodesh, the Holy Spirit, but he is not three separate beings. God is not sitting up on a mountaintop somewhere like the Roman gods and the Greek gods having discussion meetings and deciding what he's going to do with people. Uh, he is not three separate beings. Okay, number two, infant baptism began at Nicaea. Uh, baptizing for uh, children, you know, newborn instead of baptism for those that had faith to believe and know what baptism was for. Uh, confession to a man for forgiveness of sin began around that time where you would confess your sins to a priest, and if that priest didn't absolve you of sin, then God didn't absolve you of sin. Uh, that's uh, Those are three things uh, at Nicaea. Also, uh, the establishment of Christmas and Easter happened about that time. The change of Saturday Sabbath to Sunday Sabbath happens at that time. So those are some of the things that begin with the Nicene Council and, and some of the other councils around that time. Um, Carol, welcome to uh, the teaching. Also Donna and Catherine. Uh, Catherine, happy birthday to you also. I saw you had a birthday this week. Um, if you have any questions, feel free to ask them. Uh, we have to understand that uh, the, the Council of Nicaea and the other councils that took place at that time were a real uh, tug of war between those that wanted to follow the scripture and those that wanted to follow the new traditions that were being established by what's known as the Church Fathers and ultimately becomes the Roman Catholic Church. Uh, there's a tension between Jewish believers and non Jewish believers, there's a tension between uh, the, the Gentile believers of different kinds. And it's important to remember that this brings a divide that, that starts, and you have the Eastern and the Western, Eastern or Mediterranean churches. You have the Greek church comes out, the Syrian church comes out, the Russian church. And for instance, the Russian church continued keeping Sabbath on Saturday until uh, I think it's almost the 900s before that changed. So there's a lot of things that change with these councils. Were you showing me a question? I can't read that. It's too small and I'm old. Where did I miss? Who asked it? And I'll look back. Who? Okay. 
that going all the way back to the last question. Yes, so we Okay, there's how often, uh, how do I see the story of Ruth as prophecy in the end times? I believe Ruth is a great story of uh, Jew and Gentile becoming one, of Jewish of Gentiles being grafted into the people of God. Um, let me say this, that Ruth is generally used by the Jewish community, the Jewish people, to be an example of um, a Gentile converting to Judaism. But that's not actually true. If you look at the scriptures, you'll find that Ruth is called a Moabitess all the way through the book of Ruth. She's never called Ruth the Israelite. She's always called Ruth the Moabitess. And she is a great example of someone who uh, became a part of Israel. She was grafted in through marriage to Boaz, and her children, because the tribe and the lineage go through the father, her children are Israelites, uh, but she is a great example of what I believe is happening now as more and more non-Jewish people are becoming uh, connected to uh, Messianic Judaism. And when I say Messianic Judaism, that's a broad statement because Messianic Judaism has a lot of varieties uh, within it, but uh, Messianic Judaism, as in in what I consider a uh, a biblically sound Messianic Judaism that uh, that invites Gentiles to be partners and co-laborers and walk alongside the congregation uh, of God, the people of God, as part of that olive tree uh, that's been done. Okay, so uh, J. Asked, wants to know how long Moses' face was shiny before he encountered God on the mountain. I don't think we know how long Moses' face was shiny uh, after he came down. So, uh, Leanne, good to see you. Jonathan, thank you for your kind word. Jonathan says, uh, I'm older, not old. Well, thank you very much for that. Jonathan, I hope you noticed that I've tried to center myself on that TV for you, my friend. Um if you have a question and you're watching, feel free to enter it in the comments, and I'll do my best to answer it this morning. We have about uh, 15 more minutes or so of this um, broadcast, so I want to do that. I also want to encourage you, if you're from our area or if you don't have a home congregation, I want to encourage you to be faithful in finances. Uh, and if we're blessing to you, go to our website, shalompensacola.com. And right at the very top of the website, when you open it up, is a little place that says donations. And you can support our ministry uh, through donations that way. If you're a regular part of our community, we ask you to continue being faithful in that. Uh, and uh, also, if you're not a part of our community and you're part of another community, please be faithful there. Uh, that's where your tithe and your offerings should go. Okay, where do I think demons originated? Where Are they fallen angels or spirits of the Nephilim killed at the time of the flood? Just wondering how much stock you put in the book of Enoch. Okay, let me say this. These are good questions. First of all, I believe demons are fallen angels. I do not believe they are spirits of the Nephilim. Uh, the word Nephal just means fallen ones. It does mean fallen angels. If you remember when we we're talking about Nephilim in, in chapter 6 of Genesis, it's talking about people that God will not always strive with. It's talking about the events of Noah. It's talking about the people that were cast out of the garden. These are fallen people. These are people that have fallen into sin. Uh, someone's going to say, well, don't the Nephilim marry and they end up having giants? Uh, they come from that, yes, but that doesn't have anything to do with angels. And how much stock do I put in the book of Enoch? Enoch is not Bible. Enoch was not written by Enoch. Enoch is a much, much more modern book, uh, and it is the expressions and thoughts of the writer uh, and is not actually written by Enoch, the guy that uh, went to be with the Lord So that we read about in Genesis. I don't put a whole lot of value in Enoch beyond uh, letting it help us to understand the thoughts and mindsets of a segment of the Jewish society of that time. Uh, so that's what it is about Enoch. Now that doesn't mean, because uh, someone will say, well, some of these other books are quoted in the Bible. Um, yes and no, but also when Paul was right, you know, on his way to Damascus, uh, and he has this amazing experience with Yeshua, 
uh, Yeshua speaking from heaven quotes uh, a Greek um, uh, philosopher to Paul in his statement when he says it's hard to kick against the pricks. That comes from a Greek philosophical saying. God quoted a Greek philosopher to Paul so that Paul would understand what God was trying to say to him. So just because something is quoted in the scripture, it would be just as if I said, it isn't over till the last fat lady sings. That doesn't mean that, uh, that that becomes anything more than a common saying that's understood by the people of the day. Shalom, Wendy and Lou and Lisa. It's good to have you with us. If you have a question, please uh, drop it in the comment bar, and I will try to do my best to answer for you. How has Paul confused both Jews and Christians with his writing? Betty, Paul didn't confuse anybody. Paul's writings, according to Peter, were difficult to understand, but they're only difficult to understand if you take them out of the context of what Paul wrote them in. Paul writes to different groups of people, and if you've read my book, Galatians in Context, in the very beginning, I give a good example. If I were a dietitian and I was writing a, writing a series of books, and I wrote a book to anorexics, and I wrote a book to, um, to obese people, two separate books. If I wrote in the book to anorexics, I would say, if you don't start eating more food and con consuming it and keeping it in your body, you're going to die. And I wrote to obese people, and I said, if you don't stop eating so much food, you're going to die. And then I took those books and put them into one book, uh, with identifiers of when I was talking to which group, but you took the identifiers and the context out, you would think that I was speaking out of both sides of my mouth instead of understanding that I was talking to, to people. For instance, the book of Romans is largely written to uh, Jews, uh, or uh, Jew the early part of Romans is largely written to Jews speaking about their interaction with the Gentiles. In, ch in chapter 2 it says, if you being a Jew, and then it talks about how they're not behaving godly, which is causing Gentiles to fail to keep God's word in the right way. The book of Colossians, however, is written to Gentiles. So when you read the books, if you identify what the context is, the context of what they're talking about, the context of time, the context of what's going on, the context of the problem that they're having, you, there's no confusion at all. It's just when you look at them as if it's one book written to one group of people with no differentiation between them, then you have problems. But Paul's writings are easy to understand if you keep them in the context that Paul wrote them. It's only when you take them out of the context that it causes problems. Is first fruits always on the first day of the week or always three days after Passover? It depends if you follow the Pharisees or the Sadducees, Christy. Uh, I I believe and I follow and our congregation follows with the rest of the Jewish world today, the, and that is that it's three days after Passover. Uh, but there are those who believe it happened after the Shabbat of the weekly Sabbath. I believe it's talking about the high Sabbath, not the weekly Sabbath. Um, as Messianic do you, Jews do you freely write and say the names of God. It depends on what names of God you're talking about. Uh, if you're talking about using the four-letter name of God, I will write it if I'm writing Scripture, and uh, I'll use it periodically if I'm reading Scripture. But because we don't know how to say it, and nobody, anybody who tells you they know how to say it is lying to you, we do know how to say the first part of it, Yah, and everybody knows that. It's in the Psalms, but Yah is only used in poetry and song. It is never used in uh, prose or in in regular talk. So uh, I don't use a name because I don't know how to say it. And more than that, as a Messianic Jew, I believe what the scripture says, whatsoever you do in name or deed, do all in the name of Yeshua. There's no other name given among men whereby we must be saved. And when Yeshua was directly asked, how should we pray? That was a perfect time. He was correcting uh, the disciples on all kinds of things as he taught. They said, how should we pray? And his direct answer to the question, how should we pray, was our Father who is in heaven, revered be your name. So uh, there's no need for us to know the sacred name of God and how to say it. We're supposed to ask in the name of Yeshua. We're supposed to pray in the name of Yeshua. 
and and that is sufficient for what we have to know and do. Uh, the people that say you have to use a certain pronunciation of the name, in my opinion, are in witchcraft and sorcery. Because they use the name as an incantation or a spell rather than in proclaiming the nature and attribute. God. God is our deliverer. God is our healer. God is our redeemer. One of the names God uses, he says, I am Kana. My name is Kana. Kana means jealous. But these same folks, I never hear them running around going, oh, great jealous, would you answer this prayer for me? Uh, it's just not biblical, and it's taking things out of context, as I said earlier. Uh, it's good to see you, uh, It's good to see you again. Leanne, going slow, Moses. Oh, the talk about the garden. I'm glad you're having a good garden. Uh, Carrie, when Christian joins in the Messianic movement, is it is it necessary? When a Christian joins into the Messianic movement, is it necessary? Why do they tend to begin dressing like you when they aren't Jewish? Um, I don't know. There's a, a Gentile sitting right next to me, and he's wearing a golf shirt and blue jeans and tennis shoes, and I'm wearing khakis and kind of tennis shoe shoes. And a shirt, I don't know that he would be dressed any different than I am. And I'm not exactly sure what you mean by dressing Jewish. If you're asking about wearing a kippah or a talit uh, in service, then that's an act of reverence to God and, and showing that God is, a, is the king and sovereign and, and that he is above us. But I don't understand what you mean by dressing different. I, I don't know that the Gentiles, and Carrie, you've been to our synagogue. I don't think the Gentiles are, in our synagogue dress any different from the Jews in our synagogue. Or, I mean, if I went to the grocery store right now, which I'm not going to do because it's Shabbat, but if I were to walk in a grocery store, you wouldn't see me any different than everybody else walking around in the grocery store. So I'm not really sure uh, what you mean. Maybe you can uh uh, to your question, and I'll, I'll look at it again. Uh, I'm struggling with explaining to my congregation about how Passover is not on the same day each year, uh, but the Christian events. Okay, the difference is, Bob, that the Hebrew calendar has 360 days in a year, while the Roman calendar has 365 days of the year. Nothing in the Bible is set to the Roman calendar. It's all set to the uh, Hebrew calendar. And so everything in the Bible deals with it from a Hebraic biblical calendar context. Uh, that would be for the same reason that people would say, um, I don't understand why Passover doesn't happen on the Mayan calendar like it should. Uh, you know, I'm following the Mayan calendar and it just doesn't fall on the same days as the Mayan holidays. Uh, that's just not how it works. In order to be biblical, you have to follow the biblical uh, calendar. Okay, Lori, good to see you again. Thank you. Uh, Bob and Darlene, thank you. Ruthie, it's good to have you with us. What is my opinion on the validity, validity of the song of the Sabbath sacrifice? Um, I'm not exactly sure what you mean by that. Uh, if you can ask differently, uh, are many deadly sicknesses of today a result of sin? If so, what scriptures should we point to that would help a person understand why this is happening? Uh, Aaron, all sickness is the result of sin. All sickness, however, is not the result of the individual sin. Some sickness is the result of the, um, of the person's sin, but some of it is just because sin is in the world. And uh, I would answer that by going right back to Genesis when uh, Adam and Eve were taken out, driven out of the garden and uh, sin and death entered into the world. And through Yeshua, he conquered sin and death. And so prayer is the way to overcome sickness. Okay, Carrie says, I'm talking about long skirts and ladies wearing head coverings. <clears throat> um, at our congregation, Carrie, uh, the vast majority of the ladies don't wear head coverings. Some do, but they wear it uh, looking at Corinthians and other places where it talks about women wearing head covering in the New Testament. And uh, so they align themselves with uh, the understanding of, of wearing a head covering. Uh, it's not required, nor are wearing a, a long skirt. My, my wife wears a long skirt, but that's uh, what she wore when she was, for those that don't know, my wife was adopted as a child. She does have uh, a Jewish family, 
that she was uh, her ori original family was uh, was Jewish, but her adopted family was not. She was raised in a Christian home, and she's wore a long skirt all her life, uh, and always does, except you know around the house when she's cleaning, and then she'll wear some kind of pants or whatever she wears cleaning around the house. But when she goes out, she almost always wears a skirt, a long skirt. But uh, that's just what she wore as a Gentile. So uh, I walk around town. I see women in long skirts that go to churches all the time. I'm not sure that that would – I would say they wear long skirts because of that. Matter of fact, uh, most of the Assembly of God – I used to travel a lot and teach, and most of the Assembly of God or Pentecostal-type churches, uh, the vast majority of the women years ago all wore long skirts, and none of them were Jewish. Uh, and if you talk about the uh, Mennonites and others, uh, they wear head coverings. Uh, looking at the same verses in Corinthians and others, uh, part of it, as Roseanne just posted, deals with modesty. Um, and part of it also with, with uh, uh, tradition of whatever their desire, their culture, their background is, and part of it is just their desire. I know ladies that wear skirts. Uh, uh, and dresses all the time because that's what they feel most comfortable in, more what they feel more feminine in. So um, it, it, it amazes me uh, uh, that the vast difference. But if you came to our synagogue right now, of course, there's only a handful of us here. But if you were here a few weeks ago when the whole con congregation was here, you would find women wearing head coverings and women not wearing head coverings. You would find women in dresses and women in pants. It, uh, so I'm not sure... Uh, where you got the idea that women had to wear long skirts or head coverings, or for that matter, that I require in any way women wear head coverings to be part of our congregation. So anyhow, but a thank you for your question. Uh, Betty says, I wear my head covering to remind me of who I belong and honor and respect my husband's covering. That's a, a good statement. Um, let me Let me add to that part of the reason – uh, for head coverings in Judaism, in Orthodox Judaism, uh, is that when a husband thought his wife had committed adultery in the Torah, it said that the husband was to bring his wife to the priest, and the priest was to uncover her head. And so if, she's ha if the priest had to uncover her head, that would mean that she was wearing a head covering. So uh, that's part of the reason for wearing head coverings. Um, I will give my email to address that again. Actually, what I'm going to do is have my my worthy assistant type in my email address into the comment bar, and anybody that wants the uh, the paper on the timeline of the uh, entry and crucifixion, yes, at, uh, I will uh, I will email that to you. Now, I'm not going to email it to you until after Shabbat. Uh, but you're welcome to, uh, and that's not because I'm on the internet during Shabbat. I'm on the internet right now. It's because after service, I'm going to spend the rest of the day with my wife and uh, just relax and enjoy ourselves on our Shabbat. And that's what we're going to do. Ruthie says, I w wish I lived closer so you could visit. It's also beautiful. Uh, I wish you lived closer too. You know how to fix that, Ruthie. Leanne uh, says, I wear skirts because I love to dance and free flowing material. It looks beautiful as a lady. Good, good answer. Okay, we have one minute left for a question. Uh, what does it say? John's, oh, John, I don't know where that was, but let me see if I can find it. Question. John did baptism of repentance before him doing so was baptism of repentance. Okay, John wants, John wants, Jonathan wants to know if, uh, there was baptism going on before John the Baptist. The answer is yes. Uh, it wasn't called baptism. It was called tevilah. It was done in a what's called a mikvah, which is a place of living water. It can be, either be a river or uh, ocean or even a, a tank that allows for free flowing of water and complete emptying so that the water is never stagnant. And it was a regular part of Judaism. Matter of fact, when we see uh, Naaman comes to the prophet and the prophet says, go dip yourself or immerse yourself in the river seven times, that is an example of immersion or, or be called in the church today baptism. Okay, Joseph asks, the Tanakh teaches us in Proverbs 28, 9, a person who will 
not listen to Torah, even as prayers and abomination to God? How do you respond when they say or point to this to blessings in their life? Uh, I answer this way, Joseph. The Bible says God reigns on the just and the unjust. Now, we most times when we read that verse, we think about rain as a negative. But the actual biblical concept is rain is good. Rain is a blessing. Rain brings life. Rain brings uh, crops. Rain brings uh, prosperity. Rain brings all those things. And so the Bible says God lets it rain on the just and the unjust. Prosperity, as far as uh, finances and things like that, aren't what we look to as prosperity. Real prosperity is soul prosperity. And ultimately, what does it profit if you gain the world and lose your soul? Anyhow, thanks so much for being with me. I've got to go right now. Uh, but thank you so much for being part of this. We will do this again next week at 9 o'clock in the morning on Saturday. Uh, if you think about it, prepare your questions. And do me a favor, share this video. Uh, share it on your timeline so other people can see and participate and, uh, be, and join with us next week. Shabbat Shalom.